Welcome back to day two of BPM Live 2018. My name is Ian Hawkins. I'm the editor of the PEX Network. We've just heard a fantastic presentation from Nick Heimer on Concept to Kaizen, Business Process Management at Aflac. And next we have a session with two speakers, James Morgan and Neil Young. So who are they? Let me bring them up. Uh, first of all, James is the IT manager of the A14 Road Project, the largest road construction project in the UK, which is a £1.5 billion joint venture between Costain, Skanska and Belfour BT. James is a highly experienced and respected IT expert who's delivered significant technology projects in the UK across, well, everybody really, SMEs, blue chip enterprises, construction, and central government projects. Next to him is Neil, the CEO at Flowformer. These are the leading providers of, business, of, of process automation tools for Microsoft Office 365. Neil spent the last number of years driving Flowformer's business model and is passionate about revolutionizing the traditional BPM space to enable the business user to meet the needs of today's demanding digital workplace through an innovative, no-code approach. They're going to be speaking about how the largest construction project in the UK saved days by automating processes and cutting down on paperwork with a super efficient, no-code business process automation tool. So, Quick reminder to you listening in, do not forget to put your questions into the box on the left-hand side for James and Neil, and we'll get to those once the session has started. So I'm not going to delay things any longer. Neil, the floor is yours. Great, and thank you, Ian. Uh, so, uh, you know, to get uh, things moving, let's um, go straight into the case study spotlight with James. And James, a big thank you for joining us today. Uh, so if, if, if we lead in and start with the first question around the A14 project, um, let me just uh, run that one through you. So can you tell us a little bit about the A14 project and your role there? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the A14 project's been, uh, I suppose, in conception for a number of years, um, going through DCO and going through the statutory requirements. Um, I joined in 2016 uh, before we actually had any site premises. And basically, it's uh, 31 kilometres, as it says on the slide. It's uh, offline and online, so some of the construction work will take place on the existing road, and some of it's built on brand new greenfield sites. One of the uh, interesting aspects from a, an IT point of view is all of our offices were established on basically fields, so uh, there's very little in terms of infrastructure or anything existing to start with. Um, I run a small team on site, so there's five of us in terms of support, some development, some developers, and uh, a database analyst. I suppose at the moment we're at peak because we're actually in the middle of delivery. We're looking at probably around about two and a half thousand users on site at the present moment in time. Um, looking to aim for completion around about to the end of 2020, which we're still on track for at the moment. So quite a quite an interesting and diverse role, I should say. Okay, very good. And in terms of, uh, you know, the project itself, what were the main pain points that motivated the A14 to look at process automation tools? What, what was the driving factors there? Yeah, I think some of the interesting things, obviously, um, anybody that's aware of the construction industry, and, and kind of historically, it's been very paper-based, um, lots of manual processes. Um, very difficult to keep track of data on a day-to-day -day basis. As you can imagine, it's 31 kilometers of scheme we've got going on as well. So with 2,500 people distributed across that um, network, it's quite hard to make sure that we've got access to all the information we need. Um, a lot of the processes previously were all done on, as I say, on paper. So if you take something like a start shift briefing, that's delivered to the guys out on site in the morning. That needs to get back to the main offices at some stage, be scanned and uploaded into the system. So you end up in an environment where we've got piles and piles of paper, backlogs of uh, documents to be scanned and so forth. So we were really looking for something to increase the automation of that and ensure we get consistency and be able to capture the, the data. Um, poor governance is probably quite a, a key one as well, because obviously we work in a world where uh, health and safety is very key and quality of, of what's being delivered. So having the ability to go back and we, we, the ability to audit and understand the path of the process, how it's gone through from start to finish, ensure that it's actually completed and the quality of that completion as well is quite key to us. Okay, great. And James, in terms of, um, you mentioned the dispersed workforce of 2,500 people. Uh, was offline capability a big requirement? Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, as, as I said, I mean, some of this stuff with it being uh, offline, we're, we're literally working in fields. Um, certainly things like mobile coverage is not particularly great across the 31 kilometers. 
So the, the ability for the guys to go out on site to download their process beforehand, work on that process and then sync it back in when they come back into the office or get back into an area where they've actually got connectivity is obviously key to us. Um, previously, you know, the other thing I suppose is the environment you're out. It could be raining, a miserable day, so the ability to not have to play with paper at the end of the day makes a great deal of sense. Very good, very good. And, and in terms of um, your requirements, so what were your specific requirements for a, for a process automation tool? Yeah, um, as I said earlier on, it's a joint venture between Costain, Balfour BT and Skanska. So one of the concepts we came up with early in 2016 was a, a bring your own corporate device environment. Um, and one of the main kind of drivers we had behind that was to have very little in terms of physical tin on site. So we were very much looking for something that's cloud-based. We have a single tenancy as the A14 that we use for all of our user base. So something that would integrate directly into that, into SharePoint. Um, all of our users are very much office users, so we're looking for something that's kind of consistent and a known interface, interface from a user's point of view. Um, and also the other thing, we, we started down a journey of doing quite a lot of um, bespoke de development ourselves within the SharePoint environment. But as I said, we're a finite resource, small team, so it soon became fairly clear that we couldn't service all of those requests with just two of us being able to do that development. So we were looking for something that we could maybe IT act as the gatekeeper to control it, but actually start to push some of that process development out into the business and engage the business more in actually developing some of those end state processes that they were looking for. And obviously, ultimately as well, an affordable solution. So we did look at a couple of other options that were cost prohibitive, um, and we settled on flow format for cost being one of those reasons. Yeah, great. And, and in terms of engaging with the Flow former team, uh, so you would have worked through, um, how, how does that approach work? Did you work through a trial with, with our guys? How did that all come to, yeah, uh, to uh, play? Yeah, so one of the first things we, we looked at, obviously, when we uh, found the solution was to obviously uh, speak to Flow former guys and uh, set up a trial. We looked at a couple of the burning processes that we had at the present time that were waiting to be created. Um, I think we probably spent about 30, 30 odd days looking through that and playing with it in between uh, doing the day job, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And we, did you move? Did you then build out a proof of concept with our with our pre-sales team, or uh, um, just a bit more detail around the approach? What what works and what would you recommend to the audience? Yeah, we picked um, a specific process actually, which we were looking at, which is around the permit to dig, which is quite a a key process, the guys have to go out on site, they need to understand where all the utilities are buried in the ground and raise a permit to do that. And previously, it was a very paper-driven process with the paper being moved from desk to desk to achieve sign-off. So we picked that as a good process to start with just to um, understand how flow forward work for us in that kind of environment and develop that process. And it's a reasonably complex and sophisticated um, process that basically we meant during that PAC, we could test a number of the elements that we were looking for in the solution. Okay, very. So, uh, pick one key process, um, build, build, test, and learn, um, and get it to a place where everybody was comfortable with, it and and then and then uh, I suppose put the platform out across uh, more processes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and in terms of yeah, how did you come across the Flowformer process automation tool, and what what made it your preferred choice? Um, we spent obviously quite a lot of time looking for different, or looking at different applications and different solutions to um, fit our needs. Um, so obviously we were mobilising at the time, so it was quite a busy time of life anyway. Um, we we looked at things like Nintex and K2, but again it was too heavy on the, the custom development we needed to do. Um, so it was literally through searching around, I actually found it on Microsoft App Source, um, and really literally went from there, downloaded it, looked at the 30-day trial. Um, we had a, a matrices of functionality we're looking across all the different products, um, engaged with a couple of your guys to get them to complete that and obviously understand where any gaps were and assess those gaps. And to be fair, um, I think they were, they were fairly minor, some of the things that were missing that we needed. And I believe since we've actually onboarded with you guys, you've actually produced them for us. Okay, very good. Very good. And, and from your perspective, how many people did you did you get trained um, within the organisation on the tool? Yeah, we started off with um, six individuals, 
mainly within the PMO space. So our PMO includes IT, um, that looked at and undertook the original training offered by Flowforma. One of the key things that we've done probably in the last four or five months is actually try and then take that training from those of us that are using it at the moment and actually pass that information out into the business. So we're getting more and more sort of business champions that own particular processes, and then they take on the development of that solution moving forward to try and remove kind of the, the bottleneck from IT at the end of the day and actually get the ownership of processes within the business. And yeah, so just to expand on that, um, so the type of people in the, in the A14 today that are automating these processes, um, how would you describe those guys? Um, yeah, I, I mean, they're normally people that know, know their particular area or specialism incredibly well. So as an example, we've done a requisition process. So we're working with one of the buyers. Um, he understands, you know, that, that process in terms of the paper-based world and how it, it previously worked. So he has the knowledge and the insight and the engagement with other people as well. So I suppose it's not just about having that one individual to understand the process. It's where that process fits in with the rest of the business. Okay, and so you know, if if you take um, that person in particular, like, how did you, how long did you, did, did you find for them to adopt the technology, the no code technology? Um, in between doing their day job, it's probably from the region about two to three weeks, with um, probably, I would say, six to eight hours worth of sessions across that period of time. Um, yeah. We have <clears throat> all of our processes set up in a UAT environment, so we replicate anything from live into UAT and vice versa. So we have the ability for them to kind of learn and play at the same time, I suppose, and get some hands-on experience of the product before they um, look at doing anything and pushing anything out to life. Okay, very good, very good. Um, yeah, and I suppose uh, just to touch on this, so we mentioned it already, so how long it takes to start delivering the processes. So um, that's your sense. Once you become familiar with the tool, yeah, uh, that, was, that was a key piece yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, as we discussed earlier on, so um, I suppose I originally looked at the tool and spent a bit of time um, as part of that 30-day trial. Um, and then at the end of 30 days, we obviously signed up with um, Flowforma, um, instigated the training, which I think we had a couple of days on-site training delivered by one of your specialists. Um, and then from there on in, it probably, I suppose, it took us about a month and a half, I suppose, to um, really start using it in earnest. Um, sadly, that was probably more the irritation of the day job as opposed to um, actually being able to just close the doors and get on with um, developing Flowforma. We also had a, a number of processes that were kind of burning that we needed to get done. So after that month and a half, we probably did about 10 processes more or less simultaneously where we were just churning them out quite quickly. Okay, very good. Yeah, so and that just leads on to the next point, which is, you know, what process have you automated with? So you talked about permission to dig at the start, and you're looking at some other processes. So what have what are the other example processes that you've rolled out? Yeah, I mean, we've got some in the region of about 35 processes at the moment. I would say we probably get a new one probably every week or two weeks. Um, all of our processes are governed by our management systems, obviously, as I said earlier on. Obviously, in the world of construction, health and safety, and quality and so forth are key to what's being delivered. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at is obviously, you know, which are the key functions to automate off of that management system. So some of the, the examples you can see on the screen there are a, permit, a permission to dig, which is literally what it says. It's about going out and um, going through the approval process, uploading drawings and so forth, so that they know a three by three meter squared area where some digging is going to take place and identifying utility services within that. Um, that's quite a key process because as part of the permit closure, that enables the guy with, within the GIS area to be able to actually update the maps so that the next permit that's uh, fulfilled is actually um, accurate. Site visit request is quite a, it sounds quite a straightforward thing, but um, obviously it's a 31 kilometre stretch of road. It's a big project. Um, there's a lot of in industry interest in that project. So we have a number of um, site visits, I think it was up to somewhere around about 8 to 10 a week. Um, they're, it's absolutely fine doing them, but part of the problem with that is obviously we need to coordinate them. So we developed a process working with the guys that are running them 
um, that enables them to manage and schedule those visits and not overburden some of the construction guys that are actually trying to deliver the job because we can control and actually have visibility of how many are occurring, who's attending, when they're attending, and their requirements. Um, joiners and leavers, quite an interesting one. We've obviously say we've got 2,500 people on the project at peak. Um, we have a reasonable churn of staff, so understanding when people are joining, when they're leaving, so that we obviously can assess any gaps, make sure we're covered in terms of licensing, and at the same time close out that licensing as well. Um, labour request is the management of, of labour coming onto site. So again, previously that was very much done by phone calls or emails to the appropriate um, agencies for recruitment. Um, not too much in terms of visibility on our side as to who was being who was being recruited, the numbers, um, alignment to plan. So are we resourcing at the same scale that we planned within our, our, our overarching um, resource plan? Um, and that's given us a lot better control. So now we can see what's going on. There's an approval process in there for those people that have been identified as joining. Uh, materials requisition is probably one of the biggest ones we've produced and probably one of the most complex. So across the 31 kilometers, um, as an example, we order a lot of aggregates. So we now, using Flowformer, have the ability to produce a bulk order for a time frame, which is tied back into the program of activities across the job and then raise call-off orders against that. So we can see the consumption of materials across the job, um, have much, much better visibility of the spend across the job, and aligning that to the overarching program of activities across the job as well. So that's been quite key, that one. Um, and it also includes plants. So again, across 31 kilometers, we've got a lot of kit. So the ability yeah. to see when something's required, when it's on site, and then have a date for off hire and then actually be able to assess has it actually been off hired, does it need to be extended? So it's given us that visibility that probably wasn't there previously. And the other two are very straightforward. So for every flow former process request we have, we now generate um, an IT project request which is producing flow former, which just gives us the ability to define scope and set expectations of our customers, <clears throat> excuse me, as we develop the processes and recruitment, we uh, now have the ability if we have a, a resource profile for the entirety of the job. So if someone wants to bring someone on and that's not actually within the resource plan, we now can go through an automated process that goes through workflow for approval that enables people to bring in someone new on the job that's not part of the resource and profile. And it goes up to the board level for sign off and then back down to continue the recruitment process. So as I say, I mean, we're now up somewhere in the region of about 35 processes and adding to it on a week-by-week -week basis, I would say. Very good. And, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the IT project request and, you know, request a new process to be rolled out. Uh, and what we find with quite a few of our customers is, you know, success breeds success and everybody wants, you know, a piece of IT and the team to roll out more processes. Yeah, so, um, so how have you found, James, on a, on a, at a practical level, how, you, how have you found prioritizing how do you manage that within the organization, the prioritization of, of what processes should be fixed versus others? How do you deal with that in a, in a, in a real fashion? Yeah, I suppose I mean, it's an interesting one because obviously um, we had a bit of a bow wave to start with. Um, and we, that's part of the reason for indicating the project request so that we can ensure that the scope is properly defined. I think the interesting thing in working in a joint venture is obviously it's finite. So it's, it's set up, it's established for a period of time it runs like crazy, it becomes a very big business very quickly, and then obviously we'll start to um, ramp down again for closure. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier on is we're very much governed by our uh, management system. So the way we tend to work now is obviously we, we, we have the requests in, we run a change process involving the guys from the management um, system, owners, and look at the value of those processes. So it, we'll assess them on you know, health and safety from a risk point of view, um, value to the business, uh, the complexity of the process. So there's a number of different factors that we get together and have a, a look at. I mean, some of them come in, they can, it might be a day's work to produce something. Other things like the um, requisition system obviously has a much broader impact. So it takes time and obviously needs some good assessment. But we certainly work closely with the lean team as well. So they go out and identify processes out in the field that they feel are ripe for um, automation. So that we can see, you know, make an assessment on them to see where the 
it might be a process improvement or it could have some sort of lean value against it. So there's a number of different criteria to try and um, assess them, I think, rather than uh, just going gun ho for all of it. Yeah, yeah, very good. So yeah, assess and model them, um, and it's governed by, uh, I suppose, the management committee deciding uh, what's the priorities. Very good. And in terms of, you know, you talked about the projects and what they've been doing, how has automating and streamlining the processes benefited, benefited the, A, the A14 project on, as a whole? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, if you've got that faster process saves days, um, I mean, that, that's definitely a case. If you, again, look at the example of the permit to dig, um, permits are valid for, um, I think it's seven days from sign-off, and obviously, you're trying to plan in and schedule work. Previously, that would be a piece of paper that's printed out, has some additional information stapled to it in terms of drawings, and that gets passed around for desk to desk for people to sign off. Obviously, someone could be on holiday, therefore it doesn't get signed off. It's quite slow. Um, now we have the ability for, you know, someone submits, someone else gets an email to approve it. Um, we can track where things are within a process as well. We use a lot of um, Power BI against pretty much all of our processes have some form of reporting against them so that we can see where things are at any given time, so we can see where there are pain points and maybe a process is being slowed down by um, some fact or another. Um, I think the familiar interface is probably a, a key thing as well. We're working in an Office 365 environment. They're fairly straightforward forms. I would say we've, we've not really done much other than used your out of the box styling, we have our logo on there, we have some management information around the names um, and unique references for forms, but we've not done anything to overcomplicate it, just keep it clean and simple from the user's point of view. And then the other thing from um, an A14 point of view, we're very keen on data. Um, we have our own data warehouse, we produce quite a lot of Power BI reports. So it's, it's enabled us to get consistency across certain, I suppose, common bits of data that are used across the project. So we work against a work breakdown structure for our project. So everything we do is governed by that work breakdown structure. Um, and we can pull all of that data and capture that data and put it in our data warehouse. Whereas before, in a paper-based environment, obviously getting hold of that data is either some kind of manual process to transcribe that data. And, it's removed the need for things like Excel reporting and so forth because we've got data that we capture electronically and we get hold of that data more or less immediately. Um, in terms of uh, governance, and I mean, that's key for us. We need to be able to go back. We need to be able to identify when a process was undertaken, when something was delivered, who signed it off. There's a number of different areas that are critical in terms of um, the construction industry and being able to evidence information. And also from our client's point of view, things like quality inspection. So using Flow Format, we can do a quality inspection. We can show it's booked. We can show which, which inspector attended, where it was taken. Um, we can geolocate that information so we know where they are, upload photos. So all of that is, is, as you can imagine, we would be surrounded and drowning in paper previously. We now have the ability to capture that electronically. We still um, do use one of the features that you guys have provided us with, which is the um, generation of PDF documents, which we then file within our common data environment. Um, but it, it's just reduced that sheer volume of data that we would have in paper based and given us better analytics that we wouldn't have had previously. A single source of the truth is probably the key one there for us, I think. Yeah, very, very from uh, mining your data in one in one uh, data warehouse. Uh, yeah, absolutely, it's all rolled up. Um, and in terms of so, just a final question, James. Uh, until we get to the Q and A later, of course. But uh, so, what are your next steps for using Flow Form or process automation? What do you, what's what, what what where to next? Um, well, as I said earlier, on, I suppose one of the things is the, the joint venture is finite, so it will come to an end. We'll start to ramp down. We're still going through that process of identifying um, the high value processes that we can look at for automation. So one we're talking about at the moment is labor allocation, which is all of the guys on the, out on site. Currently, um, that process is conducted using an Excel spreadsheet that the guys fill in. I think it takes half an hour every day. The foreman's allowed or has to set aside to complete that. So we're looking at those sort of processes where we can gain some some quick wins and improve quality and visibility of information. 
um, certainly trying to broaden the training out to the business. So we've gone from the initial six, there's probably in the region about a dozen people at the moment now that can create processes. Um, and we're just trying to identify more and more people and bring them on board. We still very much as IT function as the gatekeepers. So we let people develop within UAT and then IT will assess it before it gets pushed over to live. Um, we're also working um, with some other projects from the High Resilience Space um, across SIP, the Complex Infrastructure Program. And I think that's one of the key things that we found is the ability to take a process. So if I take our joiners and leavers process that we've got on the A14, if SIP spin up another project, we've got LTC and 303 going on, um, they can basically take that process up that we've created. We export it as an XML document send it over to those guys, they can install it and they could be up and running within minutes using the same process. So the kind of feeling is we're going to end up with a little bit of a, a, a flow former community across these high reading and SIP projects where we can reap the benefits of each doing different processes, pulling them together and help to build that consistent way of working across SIP as well. So I think there's some, certainly some interesting times ahead, I think in the next six or eight months with um, working with some of the other projects to develop some more processes. Yeah, very good. I, yeah, that usability, that is something we promote and we've seen in other communities and it's it's definitely a big advantage and, and we kind of like to think of, you know, think of it like a, an Excel template that somebody in finance is building that they can share them with other colleagues and other businesses and we very much promote that. Yeah, so it's, yeah, that's absolutely, um, and we have, we have, you know, that could be placed up on a shareable, secure website and all those kind of good things. But uh, yeah, great. Loads of good stuff coming there, James. So um, in terms of, I'm just going to, thanks for that, James. And as I said, we'll be back uh, later on. Ian will be sharing some questions with myself and yourself and uh, towards the end. So uh, I'm just going to go through some, um, so what a, fl a brief overview of Flowforma and then t uh, take you guys through a, a click through around um, a demonstration of the product and a, uh, and an overview of all the features that exist within the product, a bit of a whistle stop tour uh, for want of a better term. So, um, you know, and, and laying that back in, in terms of James and giving that industry insight in, in James's world and, um, and the construction engineering sector and how they are using the product. Uh, when we speak with our customers, we look, we don't, we don't look to solve all the problems in the world. And there's, you know, there's, there is process issues everywhere in all any medium to large organization. Uh, but when, when we talk around what are the key areas we're looking to solve, we talk around everyday processes, which are, you know, think of HR forms, IT forms, finance forms, those uh, back office forms, essentially. Uh, then we start moving into organizational specific forms. You know, James mentioned permission to dig as their starting point. We always, we, we do see that, that it's a nice place to start. It's something that's got a bit of meat on the bone, something that's in terms of, um, high value, uh, the first project success, something that's specific to the organization. There's uh, business knowledge intensive within that organization that they understand and they can relay and they need to solve that problem. And there's a lack of visibility uh, or worst case, there's a, it's just a slow paper-based process that's taken too long. Uh, and they're, 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 a great, they're a great nugget. Um, just, that's a great place to start with. When you, when you move into what we like to call, you know, customer experience impact, you know, a lot of technologies like CRM talking a lot about this, marketing automation technologies. In our world, that's very focused on, you know, we work quite with some of the healthcare organizations and they talk about solving the white coat problems, which is the, the pay problems for the patients, uh, what the doctors are trying to solve, what the nurses are trying to solve, uh, and that's their customer. In other organizations, it could be how we, how we manage suppliers and how suppliers are coming into the business, how we vet suppliers, and how we engage suppliers. In other organizations, it could be to do with um, members of a, of a uh, sporting organization and they want to become um, coaches. So uh, and they need to be vetted with the local police and all those kind of good things. So in many different ways, different customers, different experiences with those customers, uh, the typically strategic initiatives, core to the business, they have an enterprise-wide impact and you're, you're looking for them to be externally connected. Not always, but in a lot of cases, they're connected externally with your customer. Who is your customer? Connect with them. Could be with mobile as well. And they're the areas we look to solve. They're the business process problems 
that we're looking to solve with, with our customer base uh, and integrating with the core business system. So we're not looking to go in and replace a CRM system that's responsible for sales, marketing, customer service. We're not looking to re replace ERP, any of the large player. We're looking to integrate and work within, weave within those systems to solve these process problems that essentially the packages don't solve um, or else they will solve with a lot of expense. And then when we overlay that, um, we look on, on our, you know, on our left hand side, we talk, as we move up those processes, there's more ROI being achieved as you solve those process problems. And we have seen for, for like a, a good example would be say everyday processes, the organizational specific, the ratio there is probably around 10 to one. So you could build 10 of these back office everyday processes, straightforward things to solve quickly versus solving one big organizational process problem. Um, James mentioned the materials uh, requisition piece earlier on, you know, quite a lot of strings to that process, but has a big impact when it's, when it's put in place, generates cost savings, ROI. And so the more you move up that value chain and the more external you become with your process focus as well. So I'm looking at solving problems in our industry and now I'm looking at problems connected to our customers. That just broadens the scope for what you can really achieve with the, with the platform. So in terms of, um, let, me, let me bring you through flow format and the concepts, so just so we can illustrate a little bit more how that works. Um, so what you see here in front of you would be a typical landing page of flow format. And this is what you would, so if you request a trial from us from, through our website, uh, this would be an example of a landing page and we have a, a bit of a tour that will bring you through to get you started. So let me be your tour guide today. So if you see here on this landing page, what you have at the top, um, and those blue icons, these are your processes that are waiting to be worked on. Um, if some of them are delayed, you would actually see a bar on the right adjacent to those blue icons that will show you what's on time, what's delayed, and so on and so forth. Um, and you can click through there to action your delayed processes straight away. So a small little dashboard there to, to get you working on the key processes. And as we move there down into we got the everyday processes, we got organizational specific processes, custom experience processes. And um, that's your kind of, uh, that's your canvas for where you can drop your process icons in place. Now, what you will see in organizations um, on top of Office 365 with Flowforma, you will have many, many sites and subsites, and you have processes in different places. So what we, there is a feature, um, and I might talk about it in the, uh, towards the end of the demo, but in terms of collaborative work management, it lets you roll up your processes across an organization. So this is just to illustrate one of the ways you can see your, your processes. And then you move in to the next, where the, where the, the blue-gray icons are, this around your administration functions, um, you know, sort of settings, reports, document templates. James mentioned they use PDFs quite a bit. Uh, that's something um, we do. I'd say 90% of our projects are generating some form of documentation to uh, further advance the process autom automation. Um, and flow definition, I'm going to come back to that in a, in a little while because that's really the, the crux of the, of the solution. So if I click into my process window, just to give you a perspective of how that looks on the, for the end user within an organization, Here's the three processes I have active at the moment. The, the one in the middle there is an incident management process. I'm just going to click in and see what else I need to do with that process. And what you see here, um, across the top, you have the tabs, the steps in a process, if you will. Um, Flowform is very much designed with lean methodologies in place. You only see what you need to see. So for example, if this is a standard incident, it's got four steps running, running across the top of the screen. Uh, what you will see with um, certain processes, you may ans answer some questions within the within the step, and uh, that may open up more steps, and also may open up more questions within the same step that you're in. So we very much focus on only show people what they need to see, but as they answer the questions as they move through, then create that um, uh, open up those new fields to fill in those new steps to fill in. Uh, it could be another way we use it quite a lot would be. Um, for example, materials requisition, anything over 100K needs to go to the head of procurement, anything over 1 million needs to go to the CEO of the, of the JV, and all of that would be built in with uh, hidden steps. So based on the value, those steps will open up and those extra approval steps will be implemented, uh, dynamically implemented within, the, within that process, process instance itself. So 
that's just an example of the user interface and you know simple logo up the top and I'll come back to how you can change this around that layout quite easily it can be popped out in the modal window or it can be embedded within your browser and of course it's accessible via mobile including offline and if I move back to the uh, to the canvas uh, I can then I'm clicking into incident management uh, that's how I, that's the tile that we that's the process we've been working on and if I click into the flow definition for that process which is this is the real engine behind the product so what you see here flow designer uh, on your left hand side you get the name of the process which is incident management then we have five steps below that that you can see there uh, the bottom process I mentioned that earlier on is called uh, the bottom step there is investigations completed and you'll see a little hidden icon to the left so that's a hidden step and that'll only show based on answers if necessary if it needs to be displayed and if I quickly just go into the visual flow layout of how this all joins together um, this is just a simple representation and I suppose we make the product as simple as it possibly can be in order to empower the business users and the business analysts within the organization um, but at a high level it's very important that people understand the, the flow of the process now what you will also see is uh, this can be a very good uh, whiteboarding tool in a room to start a process project so you you know you bring your business users in you you start a process in flow in flow forma you switch to this modal window you can add steps into this window as guys are calling out okay what well, so what happens at a high level and then you can publish that into flow designer and you can then start building out the detail so it's a nice way of starting a process problem, looking at how to solve it, uh, but it's also a window you can move into and modify and edit the, the process flow. Uh, and, I was, and this also feeds into your documentation at the process. I should say we adopt, you know, we talk about waterfall lifecycle, you talk about agile uh, development methodologies. We very much, very much promote the whole element of test and learn methodology. So you know the documentation will fall fall out of the system uh, at the start it's all about getting the, the right people in the mind start test start testing building out a process refine it with the business and then when it's locked down and ready you can extract your, your documentation and lock down that process so move back to flow designer and i'm literally just going to go into how do i design the layout and move that layout around so um what you what you're seeing here on the left hand side is some really we've talked quite a bit about this but what they people really want to do around changing the layouts you know they want to change the logo they want to change the theme the colors uh, they want to align this with the marketing standards that the business has in the organization um so and then you can actually at the top right there you can move around you can put in columns you can move around your data and make it more aligned with how you visually want to want to display that you can you can also actually build bring in some fields that you may want to carry across on the header as you move through the process just to just to keep that summary information up there and all is that all of that is managed within the within the visual flow to form designer uh, the next point I'm going to uh, the next item in the product I'm just going to click through we you know as a team we sat down and, and uh, over 12 months ago and talked around you know for us to really minimize the involvement of, so IT needs to be really there to support governance which you will see James will do quite a lot with the organization, but how do you promote and get this out to the business and what were the missing links? And what we found was that Security Wizard was, was a really important piece. So you can receive an Office 365 site, um, you can provide it with the right um, security rights by IT, and then you want to secure who has access to what process and who has access to what, what steps. And that's all managed within what we built out from, that, from those workshops around security security wizard so what we see here on the screen is we've got a flow and then we've got different people that can read or read and edit and um, we can actually select that drop down and go into a step and do the same thing uh, we get asked quite a bit around well so how do I make sure that certain people don't see certain things on the form that they're not meant to see they're only meant to see this amount so we control that and promote best practice through steps so that's how it's all joined up so um, for example there might be employee details you do not want certain people to see in step four you only want them to see a certain amount of that data you can carry through the data you just want them to see the restricted data into step four and you lock down step two where the more sensitive information is and that's how you might that's how it all joins together 
And just a little bit more detail there, if I, I click into a step on the left, I see incident investigation. Below that, I see what we call questions, which essentially are fields. And I can have rules on questions, I can have rules on flows, I can have rules on steps, business rules. So this is all about what's going on, what can I do? In order, this simple rule here on the right-hand side is about generating um, document generation, how to generate a document. And what we're, trying to, what we're promoting here is you know, select your document te template or create a document template. It's all around uh, you know, the intuitiveness of the product and how you, people, you, know, you can enable this to work with, with business and the organization. And then just extend on that, there's more rules here that you can see like workflow control rules, high show questions, high show steps, data integration components, um, where you're integrating to other systems like SQL and HubSpot and Dynamic CRM and user profile properties. And we're talking about sending emails, converting to PDF. So quite a lot, uh, it's very much a whistle stop tour, but just quite a lot within, within the product. Um, I do advise that, you know, if this is of interest that you, by all means, take out a trial, non-committal, and we'll have more information about that towards the end. So here's an example of adding in a question, the repeating table, a single line of, of uh, a single line of text, a digital signature is provided. And again, the interface is all intuitive that you can start creating this stuff yourself, essentially. I talked earlier on around um, when you're producing, uh, so the test and learn approach. So if you're going to go with that approach, you have to provide people with the ability to automatically output the documentation. So we have a, the flow snapshot feature, which will uh, gr grab your snapshot at a high level of what your process flow is. And then inside that, it'll provide you with what your, your questions are and also what rule actions you have on those questions with all the full detail in an output document or PDF as you require. So that fully, and we have found that really useful with our customers when they're being audited. Um, so it does feed into any compliance necessary around your process problems that you're solving. Some, um, we, have, we have some quite uh, advanced layers of reporting. I know James and the guys are doing quite a bit through Power BI and SQL, which we very much support. There's also out of the box um, analysis of your flows and where your issues are. Again, back to lean methodologies around spotting bottlenecks and identifying them and improving the process or SLAs and so on and so forth. All of that comes out of the box with the product. Um, to support people building, we, you know, we've put a lot of time and effort into you know, what do people need to, what tools do they need in terms of understanding um, you know, simple questions around how do we do this, how do we do that. So we have, a fun, we have a full online learning system, which we update every quarter. And we also are, have built up a catalog of self-paced learning modules, which we're rolling out to our partners and our customers. Um, we have some really good stuff up there in terms of reporting and learning the basics of Flowform and so on and so forth. So quite a lot of resources around the product these days. Some um, features just to be aware of, uh, we've got um, the decision um, decision management features very much supporting uh, when we talk about, you know, we asked James earlier on around how do, you, how do you guys make decisions within an organization on prioritizing. Uh, we've, we've seen people use project go no decisions with this feature, tender decisions. So basically assessing a range of criteria on something that has come in for decision by a certain committee and how all of that is managed and voted for and locked down to ensure full compliance. Um, and that's a very simple feature you can enable within the product, but with quite a lot of power. We definitely eat our own cake. So this is Air Canvas within their business whereby um, one of the areas, so if you move into ID8, which is their innovation um, area for processes, you will see another five or six processes there. So expenses, innovation, performance reviews, timesheets, leave requests, product support. Uh, so, and then you move into other areas whereby we've got um, net promoter score assessments and, and things like that. So quite a lot of use of, of, of the product ourselves just to really understand how best our customers can, can leverage it. So it was very much a whistle stop tour. Um, Here's some key elements, and, and yes, we'll be distributing and making available the PDF of our, of our slides, but uh, this is our offering. These are all the components to it. One I would draw quite a bit of attention to now, what's coming out this quarter, is flow format governance. So when you start moving into an, uh, an organization that starts building up 20, 30 processes, it's how they're moving them from sandbox to UAT to live 
they want to move they want to make a copy from live back to UAT and so forth our governance portal is going to cover the management of all those environments quite seamlessly uh, the guys have put a lot of work into it but we're quite excited about it and we think it's really important for enterprise organizations to have these features so that's just one thing I would call out from from that piece uh, we have quite a lot of credibility in the market now um, quite a lot of tier one com companies enterprise companies as well as mid-tier level organizations to some small organizations but uh, you know we have done and we're in with certain customers like Unifar, SR Oil where we're going in and we're working with their flow former teams uh, that they have dedicated to building our processes within the organization similar to how James described it with his guys so we're seeing a lot of a uh, lot of positivity there so um, so just before I, I hand over to Ian on the, on the Q&A uh, just some call outs there uh, we really do, and we, we've we've been in some of these situations where we've had to prove prove quite a lot of it's true. But we would see that in terms of an approach, and aside from the cost effectiveness, just how fast we can be. So we integrate to these ERP systems, and then we can move really fast and deploy. And, and I think 10x is nearly being too conservative, but they're they're the kind of key things. We've a lot of people using the product across the globe, um, so. Uh, by all means, give it a try. And so on, on that note, let me hand back to Ian. Thanks very much indeed, Neil. Um, great, great presentation. It's really nice actually. We've seen, we've had quite a lot of stuff that's been a little bit uh, high level. It's really nice to have a presentation that absolutely nails this stuff down and give, gets really into the nitty gritty and into the detail. So let's, uh, let's, if you, oh, by the way, if you'd like to find out more, there's a box on the side of your screen, everybody. Uh, you can download the A14 case studies from the download panel, or you can go to flowformer.com. Nice, easy website, flowformer.com. Does exactly what it says on that tin. So let's move on to some questions. I've got one from Vanessa. Uh, first one, a, a very practical one. What version of SharePoint do you require for Flowformer to work with? And does it need to be the enterprise version? So uh, yeah, we, so we predominantly serve uh, Office 365. That's their that's mm -hmm. their platform. So uh, whichever version SharePoint is at that stage, I, I know sometimes with Microsoft they may have different versions across the globe that they may update in that specific region. Um, but we support all versions within Office 365. Okay. Uh, oops, I've just managed to click on the one that is. Has it's, oh, it's disappeared. I'll go to Brian. Brian's given me a, a question here. How easy is it to integrate APIs, and what is the preferred format, i.e. RESTful or SOAP? Yes, so um, we can so we can we can support both. Uh, um, the SOAP would be the preference if I spoke to our uh, our technical guys, but we do provide um, support for REST as well, uh, and we do provide that. So we have. We have integration features that are within the product. We also connect so with SharePoint Business Connectivity Services that, that supports integration as well. But if custom, we have gone into several situations where customers provide us with their web service APIs and we have worked with both as well. And we, have, we can provide support of that through our customer success team. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is one for James. Did you appoint someone to automate your processes? And is that how you managed to get so many processes live so quickly? Just talk us through um, that. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did in the end actually. Um, the guy, a good guy that works in the team, who's our business analyst, has kind of become the uh, champion of all things flow form, I suppose. So he very much goes around and collects all of the um, requirements and deals with the user base and kind of governs that before it gets injected into the change process now. Okay. Uh, and, and while I have you, the, the A14's use of offline capability, that sounds intriguing. How, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, well, as I said earlier on, so um, uh, a very large road scheme. So we're out in the middle of fields here, there, and everywhere um, with very little coverage. So mm -hmm. the guys are able to, on tablet devices and on mobile phones, um, sync the processes before they leave the office. They then have that process available available to them when they're out in the field. They can complete it while they're whilst they're without any connectivity, not worry about the connectivity, and then sync it back up when they're um, back in an area where they've got coverage. So something like the permit to dig, that's quite key because they can mm. be um, literally in the middle of nowhere. So it's very beneficial for us. It didn't occur to me until uh, until you sort of were talking about it about just what a huge area you're dealing with and trying to get 
connectivity and uh, communication across so many people across such a big work site that must be a that must have been a bit of a nightmare indeed and also it's not a particularly because of the nature of it being a large road um in mm. for, in, avoids a lot of densely populated areas so uh, mobile coverage is pretty poor in the main i have to say okay <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, Neil, um, we like the idea of enabling external people to participate in our process. So is, is that quite a big project? Is, is it, what's, what's that like culturally getting external people to, to work through a process? Yeah, um, so, so culturally uh, the change uh, we have found, so we take um, some, some examples there and even if I took the supplier piece, so uh, suppliers wishing to become uh, so the two two phases to it. They want to become a supplier with a with a large organisation who would be a customer of ours. Uh, so there's that process and bringing them into that versus receiving a paper based word document. Now they get something that they they get a link from the from the customer and they get that secure link. They click into that link. That brings them into an online page that's secure and dedicated to them. They fill fill in that submission. They submit that and move securely in. Uh, Technology-wise, that's coming through, uh, there can be Amazon Web Services or, or Azure, but assume it's Azure and it's coming through Azure. There's a secure connection we have on, with Flow Format already pre-built, so the setup time is quite quite low, and that will mm -hmm. send the data into your Office 365 environment. Then that might true, move through five or six steps internally, and then it's passing that back out to advise the supplier, you are now certified or you're not. Let's assume it's all good. You are certified as a supplier. And um, here is your link for um, the new portal, and that'll bring them into another phase. That other phase is basically responding to quotes back and forth. They're now, they're now a verified supplier. You can now um, connect back and forth and respond and see statuses on your supplier submissions. So there's two phases there. So culturally, like in that scenario, and we have found in the world now of digital transformation, which isn't just hype, uh, that it's, you know, the, the generation now demands it, that we are finding the adoption culturally much more prevalent and beneficial and people want that instead of paper. So, and mm -hmm. you just find things that, you know, we need you to upload a photo of your passport and uh, to be, you know, as one of the credentials for um, becoming a coach, for example. Um, and it's just easier for people to do this. And you have the mobile stuff enabled. Um, it's all there. It's, it's what people want. So I think we're responding to, to the requests and, um, and I, I think culturally, it's not a big challenge at all. Uh, we found it very positive. And technology-wise, we we've had one of these projects up and running from start to finish within three weeks. So in terms of extending it out externally and including building the internal process. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, as you have raised the specter of security and talking about uploading passport photos and all that kind of thing. I uh, just want to know, is security defined via SharePoint security or does Flowformer have its own security? It's, uh, it feeds into the SharePoint security model. So uh, okay. no, we don't, have our own we don't have our own unique security model. What we have is a wizard that sits in front of it. So it sounds fast. Would you say that um, if an organization already has Office 365 onboarding Flowformer process automation, is it easy? Yeah, so um, yes, and uh, basically we have um, a set of rules around InsureStart is their onboarding program, mm -hmm. and it's, so it's designed um, pretty much within five days' time, five days of effort, and that may mm -hmm. take, and that's depending mm -hmm. on the customer, so that might take a customer up to one month to provide out their time. Um, you know, James mentioned earlier on about one of his guys taking two to three weeks, and he pretty much spent six to eight hours. That's, that's quite good and normal. So, you know, you, they allow a bit of time to get into the product and then you test it and then you do a little bit more. So, but if you work with one of our specialists, we can get the process up within a month, maybe it's two months, depending on the customer schedule. But part of that engagement, which is really important, is to get them enabled to build out the next process. Not that we do it, that they do it. And that's sure. what's really key. So we do that as well as do it at a pace. 
Okay, Neil. Okay, James, thanks very much indeed for your time. I think we're going to call it a day there. What we'll do is we'll bag up any of the questions that we haven't had time to come to, and we'll send those over to you. Just a quick reminder, if you're, if you're watching, that you can download case studies and things from the download panel, or you can go to flowformer.com, where, of course, you can book yourself into a, a, a demo uh, a demonstration as well, which they will be more than delighted to, to do for you. So that's all we have time for. Thanks again to Neil and James for, for a really interesting uh, and and very detailed look at, at their project. And this concludes our sessions for day two of BPM Live 2018. We've had a couple of great sessions today, one from Signavio, Aflac, A14 Road Project, and Flowformer, looking at process automation and Kaizen methods and, and much, much more. Tomorrow, we've got another two exciting sessions on a really hot topic at the moment, which is digital transformation. I'm hearing all about it all the time, and we're going to have a couple of experts coming along and talking to us and giving us their insights on it tomorrow. So first of all, we have two speakers from BPM Online, Andy and Alex, who will be looking at four accelerators essential to your digital transformation, and following them, pushing process automation to the edge of the enterprise. Uh, that's, uh, so that's going to be from our friends at Kissflow. So we'll see you back here at 2 o'clock. That's UK time, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Thanks very much indeed for listening, uh, and any more information you need, do come and find us on pexnetwork.com. Many thanks. Have a very good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are.